Welcome to another episode of the Heartland Author Podcast. I'm Aaron Apollo Camp. For today's interview, I had the honor of interviewing Carol Saller. Carol, a longtime editor on the Chicago Manual of Style team, is the author of three books, the historical fiction book Eddie's War, as well as two nonfiction books about copy editing, The Subversive Copy Editor and Moonlight Blogger. I'm here with Carol Saller, editor and author of Eddie's War, the subversive copy copy editor and Moonlight blogger. Carol, welcome to the uh, Heartland Author Podcast. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, feel free to introduce yourself to our listeners. Okay. Uh, well, I am an editor prim- primarily. Um, having worked in mainly academic book publishing at the University of Chicago Press for many years. Uh, I did leave there. I retired a few years ago and now I write full time and I'm writing for children mainly, middle grade novels, but I continue to consult and blog for the Chicago Manual of Style. What is it like to have worked as an editor for the University of Chicago Press? Well, it was a great privilege, I have to tell you that. Um, Sometimes it was really boring because, as you can imagine, scholars are all over the place when it comes to what they write and how engaging they are and how much work needs to be done on their manuscripts. Some are beautiful writers, uh, but they write on a really boring topic. Others are uh, maybe writing on a fascinating topic, but they're not that good with the prose. It's really a huge variety. So I read many fascinating books and also many books that were over my head that I really couldn't understand. And I um, was able to, I think, help a lot of writers write more clearly and make their work more accessible to a to their audience so even though some of the books we publish there are very obscure and won't be read by many people i i'm um, i felt privileged to work i believe in in academic research and i believe in making research available to the public and of course all those obscure monographs that the u of c press publishes are supported by their more sexy publications like the Chicago Manual of Style, and I think that is a a fine mission that I'm proud to be a part of. Now, you mentioned the Chicago Manual of Style, so I will ask you, what is the Chicago Manual of Style, and which authors and or other types of writers are generally expected to use it? Okay. The Chicago Manual is the premier style guide uh, that is, you know, source for um, information on how to use punctuation and capitalization and hyphenation, how to format footnotes, how to write mathematical expressions, everything on the whole publishing process. It's 1,200 pages of basically anything a writer or editor needs to know to get a book through publication at a professional standard. Um, It is used uh, all over the world. It's 110 years old and has had many editions. It's updated every seven to 10 years. Unlike a lot of uh, style guides that are updated annually, this is more for book publishing where people don't want everything to change every year, right? They do big projects, multi-year projects. And um, so it's also the style guide used by most commercial book publishers in the United States, uh, people who publish novels, even though the Chicago Manual is is really geared more toward an academic user. And uh, one of the things that creative writers have struggled with forever is the lack of a good style manual specifically for fiction writers uh, uh, because 
a lot of times the guidelines for academics aren't adapt easily adaptable when you're trying to um, when maybe you don't want to use so-called correct grammar all the time or whatever so um, and I, I want to add too that it's called Chicago Manual because it's because it comes out of the University of Chicago Press, um, not because it has anything to do with how Midwesterners write or talk. Um, so that's that's the Chicago Manual. Um, oh, I wanted to add that that there are efforts now to make it more relevant to creative writers, and that that's uh, what I'm doing mainly. Uh, blogging once a month at their website. It's called Shop Talk, CMOS Shop Talk. Um, I blog in an area called Fiction Plus, which is addressed specifically to creative writers and how they can take the manual and use it when it might not seem to fit what they're doing. And uh, the hope is that in the next edition of the manual, they'll be able to incorporate a lot of the advice for fiction writers as well. I'm not the only one who writes for Fiction Plus. Russell Harper is the person who, who wrote the last two editions of the manual and who will almost certainly write the next edition as well. He also blogs occasionally at Fiction Plus. Now you've... Uh written uh, an historical fiction book called Eddie's War, and without spoiling too much of your book, what is Eddie's War about? Eddie's War is about a farm boy in Illinois, central Illinois, whose older brother, much older brother, goes off to fight in the Pacific as a bomber pilot. And it's about the boy who stays behind uh, Eddie's war isn't on the battlefield, but there was plenty for someone at home to, uh, any teenager, you know, they don't need a war to have, to have questions and struggles in their life. So it's, it's just a typical coming of age with World War II in the background. Now, uh, Eddie's war is set in Ellisville, Illinois, which is a tiny village which had about 200 people during World War II and less than 100 now, southwest of Peoria and northeast of Quincy. Do you have any real-life connections to Ellisville or the Ellisville area? Oh, absolutely. I, I, grew, up, I grew up in Peoria, and my grandmother lived on the farm in Ellisville, and my family still lives on that farm, so I've been visiting it my whole life. And um, it's, it's really my origin, I feel, even though I didn't grow up on the farm, uh, I, I grew up with it. So um, one of the great things about setting fiction in a place that you know is that you don't have to invent that geography. It comes naturally to you. Um, you, you don't have to fantasy writers sometimes have a lot of work to do to plan their world building you know but this my world was already built so uh, that's that was uh, a very good thing for me now is Annie's more self-published or traditionally published it's traditionally published but that is a really big topic that um, we could have another whole podcast on, but just in a few words, I'll say it was traditionally published by Namalos, um, and that uh, press was founded by Stephen Roxburgh, who is, you may know or may not, a rock star in the world of children's publishing. He edited such writers as Madeline Langle, who wrote A Wrinkle in Time, and um, Roald Dahl, uh, and... Um, and he started his own press, but he started it as a kind of experimental hybrid um, in, I think, 2009 or 2010, which was, he was one of the first to do one of these uh, digital and print-on-demand only, you know, publishing companies. So um, that was a brave experiment, and he was in the forefront, and now he is actually retiring and closing down his 
operation and he's reverting all the rights to the authors and now I have to decide whether to just let that book die or publish it myself which is why I said this could be another whole podcast because I'm that's really in transition and I I have a lot of decisions to make without spoiling uh, too much of uh, your book the subversive copy editor what is is the subversive copy <laughs> editor about the title kind of gives me a hint it's about copy editing <laughs> you're right um but it's not how to copy edit it's more self-help for copy editors and writers um it describes how to live a good life as a copy editor copy editors are are among the beaten down of the world. They, they have a lot of responsibility, a lot of pressure, they're not well paid, they have deadlines, and, um, and sensitive people tend to be copy editors. So around me as I, you know, during the decades of my career, I was in a position to communicate with and supervise many young copy editors. Uh, I myself struggled in the early years uh, and I came to believe that there should be no crying in copy editing and that a lot of, I, I was able to put my finger on a lot of problems that I could help copy editors with. Uh, help them get a perspective on the job that allowed them to go home at night and have energy for other things. So the book has, it struck a chord. I found quite a niche in within the editing community. The book has been very successful and has, and has a second edition actually. And uh, my, my blog, the Subversive Copy Editor blog, is, uh, grew out of the book. And I've had a lot of fun attending conferences, keynoting, traveling really um, around the world, promoting that book. And without spoiling too much of Moonlight Blogger, what is Moonlight Blogger about? I seem okay. to read it. I seem to read it was like a compilation of blog posts in a book form. It is. Don't don't buy it. <laughs> it's just what it I'll tell you what it is it started out whenever it was published I don't know 10 years ago or something I had no intention of self-publishing a book but I um, because I advise people all the time on all aspects of publishing I needed to know how to self-publish a book this was in the early days of of um, self-publishing through Amazon create space for Kindle um, and whatever. So I went online and I thought, well, I need some material, so I'll just grab all these blog posts and format them into book form. I, walked, I wanted to walk through all the steps. I really didn't have the intention of pressing go on the, you know, the publishing button. But then, you know, I got it all together. It was really easy. It was fun. I thought, huh, well, you know, why not just publish it? I don't have to promote it. No one will buy it. So I pressed go, and, and people started buying it. And then I was embarrassed because I didn't think it was worth the money. So over the years, I've taken it down at different times and then put it back up. Um, other times, I've offered it just for free, the electronic edition. Um, or for 99 cents or whatever, I really should take it down because now all those blog posts are pretty old. Although I have to say they've held up pretty well. Uh, <laughs> but I would not advise anyone to buy it. I would advise you to um, wait for a promotion where it's free and then just get it in electronic form. Or, or And you can read all of the same things at my blog. Although the one advantage to the book is that is that there's an index so you can unlike the search function at the blog it's it's really easier to find something that interests you if you look in the index of the book but that's moonlight blogger yeah let's not spend any more time on that i'm the world's worst promoter for that you can you can tell <laughs> 
Now, a mistake that some writers make is relying too heavily on the built-in spell checker of a word processing program such as Microsoft Word to proofread manuscripts. Why shouldn't writers rely heavily on a computer spell checker? And this question came from your booking notes. Oh, yeah. Um, well, I think uh, what, what I thought was a good topic wasn't specifically the spell checker. It was the grammar checker. Well, the, the whole, it's a package, spelling and grammar, the, um, the, the checker, let's j just say. And, yeah, it's... Um, it's it's very difficult to use the checker at word and feel as though you can rely on it in any way i mean for this the spelling itself it, to take an example is unreliable because it word doesn't have any ability to judge the context it just is a pure robot mechanic mechanical type of interface so if you type something like um, the word pecked, it will stop on it and ask, did you mean packed? Even when if you say, you know, the, the, the suitcase looked like it had been pecked by birds, it will say packed. And you'd think, well, I shouldn't have said suitcase because that sort of sounds like it's reading your context. Um, but at any rate, uh, it, it flags bizarre, it makes bizarre spelling suggestions. And if you're not confident about your spelling, you might, it'll upset you. It'll send you to a dictionary. And you might have been just fine all along. Um, it, it won't stop when there really is a spelling error. If you wrote, if you wrote, in fact, for a fun demonstration, of what the kinds of things that Word will fail to catch. Uh, this week, there's a blog post, I didn't write it, at um, CMOS Shop Talk that gives an example. It gives a little paragraph. Can you spot the errors? And in this little paragraph, there are seven errors that most people would notice right away. Uh, things like uh, spelling unfazed instead of uh, U-N-F-A-Z-E-D, which is correct. This paragraph spells it U-N-P-H-A-S-E-D. But Word does not catch that. And, and it doesn't catch any of the errors in this little paragraph at the blog post. Um, if it, one of the examples was pouring over something. You know, you're pouring over a text. And a lot of people do misspell that as P-O-U-R, like you're pouring water from a pitcher. But it's actually P-O-R. ING when you pour over a text, but Word won't catch that because pouring O-U-R, it is a word. So, so it, it doesn't understand what you're trying to say and it flags everything. It flags millions and millions of errors. So it just slows you down in a counterproductive way. Um, now I will say that if you train it, if you spend a lot of time turning off all the default options, turning on other options, really going into the innards of the spelling and grammar check and teaching word what you want, it can be very powerful and helpful. But um, most people aren't going to do that. Um, so I would, uh, my advice is either to teach it what you want um, or if it mainly just uh, corrects things that, um, the same things over and over again, you can you can uncheck that setting to prevent future warnings about that. Um, or, you know, when you use it, just always keep a dictionary or the manual of style or, or some other grammar ha handy so that you can double check its advice before you take it. Yeah, I will uh, say that uh, uh, Computer technology can be very useful, but it's not a replacement for uh, human editing or proofreading instincts. Well, you put your f finger on exactly the right solution because, uh, of course, I would always recommend having a copy editor before you uh, publish or submit any of your work. That is going to be the main the main thing. Uh, an, a, writer, a writer can't really copy edit themselves, you know. Even, 
I mean, for goodness sake, even when I was working at the University of Chicago Press, most of the writers I was copy editing were, had PhDs, and a lot of them had PhDs in English. They taught grammar and spelling and, and much higher, you know, uh, forms of English, and, and they still welcomed copy editing, and, and I found plenty of stuff to correct in their work. It's just because writers, that's not your job, is not to check yourself while you're while you're writing, your mind is working on a different level. It's it's a it's just you. Can, no one can multitask to that level. And then later, when you go over it, you still tend to supply what you meant mentally. When you read your own work, you tend to just supply what you meant. You don't you don't see it through someone else's eyes. So having that other eye, and especially a trained eye on your work, there's really no substitute for that. Although I, I could put in a plug, there is a, a really fine editing add-on to Microsoft Word that does use context. Um, it's called Perfect It, and um, I don't recommend it for, for the casual writer or even the professional writer. It's, it's mainly something that, that copy editors would buy because it's a subscription and, and um, I, you know, I don't think, I don't think writers should be distracted by work that is properly the copy editors. They should do their thing. Just write. Now, I do have a couple other questions from your booking notes. Uh, one of them are, is, why are good editors not sticklers? Because that's often a stereotype of edit editors. Yes, it is. And, you know, it's a stereotype for good reason, because there are, I'm sorry to say, many editors who, whose modus operandi is just to crank that text through the style guide and, and make it uniform and grammatically correct and to ignore issues of voice and nuance and humor and uh, subtlety, and that is not a good thing. They're also power tripping editors who feel like their style guide is a Bible. People call it that all the time. People call the Chicago Manual of Style the Bible of editing. And you know, that really gets on our nerves because the manual itself does not take that approach. It says constantly throughout the manual, these guidelines are not meant to be ironclad rules. They are meant to be applied with flexibility and judgment. They will not fit every case. And so a good editor knows that. Um, a good editor keeps up with grammar trends. Things change all the time. The, the rules you learned in school, are a lot of them were are no longer true, or they were never rules to begin with. They were just something that got into a, some kind of school book a hundred years ago and never was able to die. Zombie rules, we call them. Things like not ending a sentence with a preposition is a total zombie rule. There is no basis for it in any grammar, no grammar professional authoritative grammar book that you will buy today will have that rule in it because it isn't one. And yet it's still very popular and people still believe it. People still believe everything they learned in high school in English class, even though they wouldn't dream of believing everything they learned in science because they know things change and and that the information was old. And, and just think, if you, if you were in school learning English in 1980, that book was probably published in 1960 or earlier. So um, this is why editors who are good editors stay up to date online. They retrain all the time. They read posts by linguists and, and other editors and writers and um, they, they follow language trends, they go to conferences, they read a lot of books, 
and blog posts and they know that, for instance, it's really, really gaining acceptance now to use the singular they in many contexts. Um, the, just to be inflexible is not, is not a good trait for an editor, especially if you're editing creative writers. You actually answered the last question I had from your booking notes, so I will now go to a, uh, a non-writing related question. This is the final question of the interview. When, re when I was reading the bio on your website for your book, Eddie's War, you mentioned that you were in Berkeley, California during the 1989 World Series earthquake that struck the San Francisco Bay Area. What is it like to survive an earthquake? Well, um, I, first I have to say no one has ever asked me that question before, so I have to pause a second and think. I do remember it very clearly, and I think survive is what made me laugh because I was very well protected. I was up in the hills, which are solid rock, and in the hills we felt, I mean, the house shook. Uh, we were, I was there just for... Um, uh, six months living in a house in the hills and I had I was home with my toddler who is about two years old um, and the house shook and what the words that came out of my mouth don't make any sense but I'm gonna tell you what they were the words that came out of my mouth were who's doing that as though I was picturing a giant shaking our house and then I and then the penny dropped and I and I, my next words were, it's an earthquake. And so I ran out of the house, and then I had to run back in because I forgot my kid, which I'm not proud of. Grabbed the kid, ran back out to the street, and uh, at that point, my husband at the time was walking, he was walking home from work, and he was walking along the street, and he said, did you feel that? And I said, yeah. He said, you know, the cars on the street jumped. And we, we sort of laughed it off because we were new to California. We'd heard about California earthquakes, that they happen all the time. Um, and we thought, because of where we experienced it, we just thought it was one of those little earthquakes that happens all the time. And it wasn't until later, when we turned on the radio, that we heard that it had really been a horrible tragedy. Um, and, and we were shocked that we that we hadn't experienced it that way but then of course over the next weeks living in that area it was um it was pretty horrible the you know uh, the highway that we used collapsed uh the bridge that we used collapsed we we couldn't really go into the city at all because uh, by san francisco i mean because we were afraid to use any of the transportation uh the bridges or the or the um you know, subway, and um, and of course, then there was just terrible loss of life and also a huge, you know, economic hit to that area. So that's what it was like. Oh, I haven't thought about that in a long time. Well, Carol, uh, thank you for appearing on the Heartland Author Podcast. It was my pleasure. I didn't mention this during the interview, but for Kindle Unlimited subscribers, Moonlight Blogger is available on Kindle Unlimited. Carol was a fascinating guest for this podcast, and this podcast will return next month with more interview guests. This is Aaron Apollo Camp reminding y'all to write your imagination. Bye for now. You can learn more about me and my book writing projects at authoraac.wordpress.com. You can also follow me on Facebook and Twitter at AuthorAAC. You can also watch videos on the Heartland Author channel on YouTube. Copyright 2022, Aaron Apollo Camp, All Rights Reserved. This podcast episode is intended for the private listening of its audience.
any reuse or retransmission of this podcast episode without the express written consent of the podcast host is prohibited except under fair use guidelines. Royalty-free music and sound effects obtained from https colon forward slash forward slash www.zapsplat.com.